Good morning, everybody. It's uh, my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first webinar in our project, Changing Research Methods in COVID-19, uh, Methods Suited or Adapted to Research in Times of Physical and Social Restrictions. Um, we're going to be running for a, a couple of hours. And, um, and if you uh, are on social media and would like to, to tweet, then we're using the, the hashtag COVIDNCRM, um, as is written on this front slide. Um, my name's Rob Meckin. I'm a uh, presidential fellow at the University of Manchester in the School of Social Sciences. And I've been on this project with two colleagues, uh, Professor Melanie Nind at the University of Southampton and Dr. Andy Coverdale, also at the University of Southampton. And they'll be introducing themselves um, slightly uh, soon. Um, so in terms of what we're going to do today, um, first of all, we'll have an introduction, uh, an introductory, an overview from the th from myself and Andy, and then I'm going to invite uh, a team, uh, the In Touch team, and they're going to talk about adaptations and sensory and material methods in COVID-19. Um, and then, after five uh, minutes of Q and A, I'll invite Poppy Gerard Abbott from the University of Edinburgh, and she'll talk about. Um, transferring online, valuing COVID-19 methodologies. Then we'll have a, a 10 minute break. And uh, then Melanie will take up a, uh, a session on um, expressive methods. Andy will talk about survey methods. And then I'll finish with uh, secondary and uh, secondary data analysis. And then we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A and then a brief uh, next steps and closing. Uh, obviously, the timings are slightly out now that we've started a, a few minutes late, but uh, it gives you a rough idea of how we're going to go. Uh, in terms of how we're running the meeting, it's, it, we're running it as a, a webinar, so all participants are muted in terms of uh, your microphones and videos, partly because we're recording and, and the speakers uh, have their videos and microphones enabled. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and they've given consent for recording. The um, so any communication, if you could use the the chat function, Mel and Andy are going to be uh, surveying and responding to questions on the on the chat and in the Q and A sessions, they can check through uh, what's come up and and we can po put questions to the speakers at that time. Uh, so this is a. Uh, part of NCRM, we're affiliated with the National Centre for Research Methods, which is comprehensive training in research methods. Um, and NCRM is a, a UK-wide organisation funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, and it delivers online resources and a comprehensive programme of online and face-to-face -face training, including core and advanced uh, quantitative, qualitative, digital, creative and mixed research methods. I officially started at NCRM in January 2020, um, just as NCRM was funded for five more years in its fourth phase. So it now ends in 2024. And my proposal and uh, my interest still is to understand interdisciplinary collaboration, infrastructure and innovation in the context of methods, both in the social and natural sciences. Uh, so why, uh, why have we got this project and, and what's uh, the webinar, what's the position of the webinar? We're, we're obviously in a, a very difficult period um, with social and physical restrictions because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, ways that that's unfolding and the kinds of uh, societal and social <coughs> changes that are happening that are affecting our methods. And so a lot of the methods and practices that researchers are, are, have been doing um, and are comfortable with needed adapting, need changing in order to keep research moving and keep going and keep progressing. There's been a huge amount of um, activity uh, in terms of um, blogs and, and support and crowdfunded documents. And I'm sure lots of people will be aware, for instance, of Deborah Lupton's crowdsource document, which has been very useful to lots of people. So that's the, the background to the, to the project. And what we were interested in doing uh, is, is um, synthesizing some of that information and some of that support and providing a platform for sharing. 
So our project um, was had two main aims, which were to synthesize the evidence available to the research community on how social research methods have been adapted for or may work in the pandemic conditions <coughs> and to engage the research community within and beyond the academy in learning and sharing positive methodological responses to and possibilities within the constraints of COVID-19 measures when conducting social research. I'm just moving my head out of the way there. Um, and so the project's design, um, we, sorry, we, in terms of objectives, we had, um, we wanted to stimulate sharing of the challenges and adaptations in terms of methods to conduct a rapid evidence review and, and a synthesis of emerging gray literature and to produce and disseminate some guidance materials. Um, and we had two uh, work streams. The first was around the published evidence that was emerging, uh, which is led by Melanie and, and a lot of the work was conducted by Andy. Uh, so we had a, a rapid evidence review and a gray literature review in that work stream. And in the engagement side, which is the side I was leading, uh, we were looking at sharing experiences and resources um, through a series of workshops. And those two sides, we, we were meeting every couple of weeks uh, to discuss what we, were, what we were doing and what we were finding in the different work streams. Um, Mel and Andy came to, to all, all of the uh, workshops between them. And so with, then out of that, we're making uh, reports and co-produced resources. So lots of things were, were shared by participants in the workshops. Um, uh, guidance materials and these webinars as well, <coughs> of which this is the first as a second one um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Andy briefly, uh, so he, he can just talk quickly about the rapid evidence review. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, just a quick intro for me, uh, just to start with. So I'm Andy Coverdale. I'm research fellow at uh, the Education School at the University of Southampton, um, where I'm primarily uh, doing participatory research with people with learning disabilities. Uh, and my main role on this project, as, as Rob mentioned, was working with Mel on the, uh, the rapid evidence review, which I'm happy to talk about now. So, knock it on to the next slide. Thanks, Rob. So, um, so yeah, developing our sort of protocol around this, lots of explorative work and piloting of methods. You can see a, a summary of our searching for the literature there. I won't go through all of that, but um, you can have a look at some of the sort of the search terms that we used. I think the key thing with, with rapid evidence reviews is that it's important to obviously ad adopt a very systematic and rigorous approach, but also be prepared to make concessions and be flexible within the time constraints, which in our case has been a six month project. So for example, I mean, we set out search literature on comparable sort of crises like SARS and Ebola, but that we found that wasn't particularly relevant. Um, thought, thought about forwards and backwards in sort of citation searching, that wasn't particularly effective in our 2020 sort of time span. Um, so, so we, you know, we focused instead on like the hand searching of selected journals. So it's, it was very much about, as I say, that rigor, but also being flexible around that as well. Uh, so on the next slide, um, I mean, I won't go through these, but you can see sort of the stages of filtering down the papers using inclusion exclusion criteria um, to get to those highly relevant and informative. Uh, papers. We did reserve others that can help with the, the contextual information, sort of help us map the literature more broadly. Um, in terms of numbers, I mean, we're talking about roughly 800 papers, odd papers down to about 50 or 60, which is sort of ongoing. So, um, so yeah, and those, with those final selected papers, we did develop quite a rigorous quality criteria for evaluating them. For the, um, for the synthesis, which is ongoing. We, we're still uh, obviously doing that now at the final stages of the, of the project. Um, th there was clear challenges with COVID and obviously how researchers have gone about creating solutions, but we also found COVID has presented researchers with an impetus to create new research and adapt projects. So 
interesting to obviously look at that dynamic. And obviously we were very interested in how effective these examples have been as well. And then the final slide, Rob. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, obviously with a lot of the COVID related published literature is yet to come. Um, but we did have examples um, of things being fast tracked, you know, um, and there's so there's some examples there I won't go through. You can see uh, uh, three examples there. Um, certainly we're, we're ev evident from call for papers that there's more special issues to come this year, but obviously the, the, the published literature is yet to catch up in many ways with, with obviously the, the typical lit literature sort of publishing cycle. Um, so lots more to come obviously this, this year with, with that. So it was important that we also tapped into the gray literature um, uh, obviously a great opportunity to get things out fast. Rob's already mentioned Debbie Lupton's crowdsourced documents, which was, which was widely distributed earlier in the year. Some really good blogs as well that we've come across that we've used as resources. And obviously the grey literature has informed and pointed us to some of the published literature to come. Um, and yeah, and I, I would just add to, again, what Rob said, you know, throughout I think reviewing the literature, the published and the grey literature has has informed and been informed by the workshops and, and you know, the wonderful people we've had on our workshops. Uh, and so those the two strands, the two work workflows have been very much interconnected. Thanks ever so much, Andy. That's that's great. And uh, I'll just give a little overview of the um, engagement uh, work that we were doing. So we ran eight uh, online workshops from December, September to December uh, last year. And these were on interviewing. Uh, that was particularly something that ESRC were, were interested, the funder were interested in uh, making sure that we um, got some guidance up quickly. Um, and uh, working with groups with additional challenges and participatory and deliberative methods. We had a session on ethics and creative and sensory methods, and then online ethnographic methods, survey and longitudinal methods. And finally, we um, decided to have one on COVID-19 data and secondary data. And uh, our aims were around um, knowledge exchange. So we were inviting people who had had experience of um, adapting their methods in in the pandemic either in in an open project that have been running on or they've been planning and working out how they were going to do a, a project on in the sort of changeable conditions and so they were offering support and, and sharing the different ways they found through um the issues and um one of the key things that we uh, developed was using a metaphor to explore um, people's experiences and using that as the foundation to, to kind of uh, discuss and um, and talk about what people have been involved in and <coughs> excuse me uh, we had uh, sort of adapted a, a a method from the steps center in Sussex which is called rivers of life where people represent their personal history as a as a river and their engagement with the environment and we turned this a little bit into the rivers of research and people were uh, participants were asked to uh, create an image or, uh, and think about their uh, last year of their research experience and to represent that in terms of a river and we had lots of lovely uh, images and ways that people had uh, had taken that we offered a bit of guidance um, around kinds of features of waterways but people um, you know took it uh, and played with it a lot in their own ways. So we had um, lots of people using rivers as their own lives, people traveling down rivers, um, people traveling up rivers. We had dams and, and whirlpools and, and boats and all sorts um, and different kinds of uh, representations. So biro drawings and collage and, and all sorts. So it was, it was a really nice way to, to explore and it became turned into what had been an icebreaker uh, exercise became kind of the core of the of, or a, a, a significant part of the workshops which you know we had between um five and 18 people at uh, in the different workshops and uh, here's an image which um 
Christine Hine uh, at the University of uh, Surrey uh, was gave us permission to share just to give you an indication of the kinds of things this is from her view as a, as a PGR director and, and seeing PhD students uh, navigating through the through the the, the river of uh, the last year <coughs> so uh, just uh, the top line from the engagement really is there are lots of ex expertise and people are keen to share and discuss and there are many researchers in similar situations who uh, whose expertise you can draw on and uh, and seek out we found that um, and partly because of the, uh, the the metaphorical method, rivers kind of draw attention to pace and timing um, and speed. And uh, so th that came out quite strongly in terms of how the long lockdown had affected methods and that the uncertainties that we're all facing um, are, need new research contingencies in terms of research design and how we're understanding how to how to deal with these kinds of uncertainties. <clears throat> 